There's no point playing it safe. Safe will always be forgotten. This is something which the world can benefit from. Well, it's not about the size of the dog in the fight, but how hard the bite of the dog that matters. It's all about building sweet experiences to everyone. If you believe it enough, just go for what you believe in. Singapore started small, but always thought big, dreaming of becoming a global city. This practical pragmatism has paid off, bringing talent, investors, and opportunities from everywhere, and creating an economy that sees the world as its market. But a new breed of Singaporean is building on those pragmatic foundations and inspiring a new, passionate era. With their city as a muse, these innovators look to the world, taking homegrown talents to a bigger stage. Andrew Tang wants to be a professional wrestler. He dreamt about wrestling as a child and never gave up. Five years ago, when he turned 23, Andrew and a Russian partner set up the country's first professional wrestling organization, funded with Andrew's savings. Five years on, SPW matches are drawing legions of loyal fans. Our tickets are about 90, 95% sold, so this is going to be a very good event. It's going to be a, it's going to be a real hype event. I think everybody's hyped up for Russia versus Singapore, and of course, like the main event because it's the hometown hero. Okay, maybe I'm not really like hero, but an anti-hero against the, the big bad Russian bear, you know. <laughs> Andrew goes by his ring name, The Statement. The statement Andrew wants to make is a dead giveaway for his fans. I just want the fans and the wrestlers to not underestimate this small Singaporean guy. I mean, you, you ever heard of the saying before, it's not about the size of the dog in the fight, but how hard the bite of the dog that matters. You know, and now um, one tough dog. The bounce is a classic. And the narrative is a metaphor crystal clear to Singaporeans. Of the smaller guy who fights his heart out against the odds. Singapore may be small, but we are mighty, just like me. We Singaporeans, we always punch above the weight. Working in a different arena, Jonathan Hung also has Singapore punching above its weight. Jonathan is a management consultant and president of Singapore's only outer space technology association. More... Jonathan has created an entrepreneurial ecosystem of scientists, business executives, engineers and dreamers who envision Singapore going into outer space or at least competing in the lucrative field of space technology research. Enthusiasts call this exciting sector new space. I think um, space technologies is not uh, uh, something that is uh, isolated. 
uh, and looked at in silo because many of the things uh, that are developed for space can be developed uh, for terrestrial usages. And I think one of our missions is to see how we can harness uh, both uh, pure space activities uh, and its adjacent possible usages uh, for everything that uh, happens on the ground as well. The mission is pure ambition. The numbers don't favour Singapore. Tiny Red Dot Singapore is playing alongside bigger nations with thicker wallets. Even government-funded space programs, like those in China, India and the United States. I don't think we are here to compete with the, the big boys in space. We would like to learn from them. Singapore sees its value in complementing a lot of their missions, being innovative, uh, being nimble and a small nation uh, allows us to try new things quickly. Singapore's new space sector is just developing. Other economic engines here are muscling ahead in a city-state that seems to be maturing. Singapore built its economic miracle through hard-nosed pragmatism, emphasizing reliable growth-producing sectors such as manufacturing, finance, trade and banking. But fresh fields are throwing off bright and hopeful sparks in what's known as the creative industries. Janice Wong, 32, is the poster girl for the idea that people can wrest profit from their passions. Janice is a master dessert chef and an artist. She fuses those disciplines in her own brand. In the 2000s, Janice was among the pioneers creating a fine dining scene in Singapore. Twelve years back, um, Singapore was very premature in the dining scene. And to take these risks and challenges, um, that was definitely something of a very high percentage of failure. Right now, um, there's a lot of support for local. So I, I would say more and more people in this young generation are taking more risk. Um, they're having, you know, more inspiration. People are more and more um, daring to, to be different, to stand out, to have a voice. Food fanciers worldwide know Janice as the dessert queen. She has a string of bistros and sweet shops in Tokyo, Macau, Hong Kong, and Singapore. Today, she's opening another sweet shop in her hometown. So expansion is always a challenge, uh, not just only keeping the quality, but also expanding your ideas and the experiences to the public. I think for me, it's all about building sweet experiences to everyone and for them to enjoy not just the visual, but the taste and the flavors of what we have to offer. Janice often finds inspiration for sweet new experiences in classic Singaporean flavors. She's betting local favorites will win taste buds, hearts, and minds everywhere. As a Singaporean, I love our flavors a lot. I miss them when I'm overseas. So it's very natural for me to use our flavors, especially pandan gula malaka, chili padi, you know, all the um, aromatics of uh, all the melting pot of uh, cultures that we have here in Singapore, such as, such as Indian, Chinese, uh, you also have your Thai. So I've took inspiration of all of that and um, kind of created maybe about nine flavors so far. Um, there's a lot more to go. Janice wants to expand her brand. And not just by her chocolates, but through her art. In the process, she's showing how passions can survive, even thrive, in commerce. Fazri Rashid sees Singapore as his muse. The city's scenes and stories are his font of inspiration. Fans know Fazri as Faka Faz, 
a stand-up comedian, one of the city's most successful. My name is Faz, I am Malay from Singapore. If you're wondering what this is, this is what a Singaporean was supposed to look like, okay? Uh, <laughs> oh, man, it's hard. As Fuzz, Fazri gets his laughs in public, but his punchlines come in private. That kind of space and isolation gives you the silence and time to think. Sometimes a lot of my jokes are, come to me when I'm in the car. Like, it doesn't like, it doesn't come to me when I'm writing most of the time. Most of the stories that I've ever told were told from the heartlands of Singapore. Singapore is a very big, uh, you know, is is a catalyst to, to 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 my like creative process. You have to talk about what you know. So what do you know? Your surroundings. What are your surroundings? The people around you. Who are they? Singaporeans. <laughs> Fuzz is something of a hometown hero. A year ago, he had a shot at stardom and scored big. Oh, man! It's hard, isn't it, man? We try and travel the world and try to tell people that we are Malay, but we cannot do that because why? Every country you go to, there is a race that looks like you, right? The resulting exposure opened doors not only for Fuzz, but for a new generation of other Singaporean talents. Yeah, if there's anybody that's, uh, that's, uh, that, 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 that's in his bedroom right now watching this, you know, and thinks to himself like, oh, I want to be like that one day. I want to be a stand-up comedian one day. Yeah, of course, do that, right? I would, I would uh, encourage that 100%, but please know, that in pursuing this life, it's not an easy road. Come up and tell your story. Come up and be different and offer yourself. Not only am I showing myself that it's possible, I am also showing you that it's possible, right? Possible. But they don't call it show fun. They call it show business. Fuzz, who left school after his O-levels, can testify to that. Looking back, I look, wow, I did, wow, man, I work as a cleaner. Wow, I work as a security guard. Oh, wow, I did those jobs. I can incorporate whatever I learned that there into stand-up. So it was, it wasn't a road where I felt like, oh, man, I'm, I'm, I'm making ends meet so that I can make it in stand-up. I was just happy where I was, earning the money that I earned and being able to be on stage at night telling the jokes and telling the stories that I told at that point of time. And that's really the key. If you really love what you do and you're very genuine and you're very sincere with what you do, the universe will pave its way to, towards wh wherever you want to be. Once, Singapore hardly had time for lofty notions like following dreams and satisfying passions. Priorities were concrete and urgent, like growing an economy, creating jobs, and housing people. In 1969, Liu Tai Ke became head of design and research at the Housing and Development Board, known to all as HDB. The economy was very low. I imagine it's like $400 uh, per capita GDP and also everywhere you went you saw slum in the sub houses and the squatters there was definitely a great need to upgrade Liu personifies the sacrifices of the post-independence era his father was a prominent Singaporean artist Liu wanted to study art as well his mother Eager for the family to escape poverty, pushed him to be practical. My mother said, why don't you go to Australia for a part-time architectural course? I realized that there was a lot of meaning to be an architect. I can help people uh, improve their lifestyle. And my intention was to come back to Singapore to help people build houses. It's not easy to overstate what that sense of duty led Liu to build. 
He largely planned and designed Singapore's public housing model. HDB projects became one of the cityscape's most prominent elements. HDB gets both praise and criticism. Praise for successfully housing 80% of the population and for effectively creating a nation of homeowners. Critics deride HDB's design for its facelessness, which some call a metaphor for city life and residents' aspirations. The government, the political leaders, never mentioned once that they wanted me to create iconic buildings, not once. Whereas you go to many other cities, the political leaders, the first thing they say is, oh, come, I want to show you my iconic buildings. Whereas we, did, we put our priority on improving people's lives, improving the land to be, you know, functional. So uh, I would like uh, all Singaporeans not only to appreciate this, but also to remember that we need to carry on this philosophy uh, to the future. Priya challenges that uniformity. She creates what she calls public art, installations in public spaces, sometimes placed with official consent and sometimes not as in two recent projects. The meaning behind the Golden Staircase was the whole idea of transformation from a very banal space to something that was otherworldly. No one actually makes use of the stairs, so in a way it becomes disregarded, and I wanted to claim sort of like an ownership with the stairs. So the inclusion of like gold on top of a very cemented ground kind of like just transformed the space into a, a, something that was more enriching, enlivening, and it, it completely changed the, the whole um, atmosphere of the space. And it's always a good time to go against the status quo. It depends like what your work is about. It depends where you draw the line, you know. You obviously don't want to offend anyone. You don't want to hurt any sort of like religious or political. For an artist, it's what do you want to provoke in your work. It's just about challenging. The whole preconceived notion of what art is, it starts from that. People are going to question, how is this art? And, and why does this constitute as art? That is already like bringing about their, their whole idea of what art is. This is what I'm trying to provoke. One of the things about the genetic While Priya is pushing boundaries in arts, Tan Min Han is doing the same in medicine. Dr. Tan is an oncologist and a researcher. Foreign multinationals often commercialize Singaporean innovations. Tan, who was developing cancer diagnostics in Singaporean government labs, reversed that pattern. He bought the patents on the products he was developing and started his own cancer diagnostics firm, Lucense. Lucense liquid biopsies analyze a blood sample to gauge a patient's risk of cancer. A less invasive screening test compared with a tissue biopsy that requires surgery. Liquid biopsies can screen for the risk of cancer. Imagine this to be something like of a detective to actually profile um, a neighborhood without actually breaking into the house. What this means is that instead of having um, the pain and the discomfort and the risk of an invasive procedure, um, much of this can be bypassed by a quicker and uh, less invasive blood test. Min Han wants to expand overseas. He recently set up offices in San Francisco and Hong Kong. To succeed, he needs to persuade physicians to embrace his technology. Today, he's at the Hong Kong Doctors' Union, one of the oldest medical groups in town. I understand that uh, we have, uh, in our midst, um, 
many primary care practitioners. Um, For me, so growing Lucent as quickly as possible is an imperative. It is a must. This is something which um, the world can benefit from, uh, especially here in Asia where we see 60% um, of the world's population and amazing 4 million cancer deaths a year. I mean, this is something which we would hope the, technolo the technology we have should be able to reduce. Min Han, Janice and others keep making inroads overseas. With each milestone, they extend Singapore's influence and build the city's brand. But contenders from the ambitious Red Dot are now working on much bigger stages than usual. Get up, my man from Singapore. Buzz, y'all. Give a round of applause. Come on. What's up, man? Award-winning dessert chef Janice Wong has achieved fame worldwide. This Singaporean has multiple talents. She's an artist, and not just in culinary terms. I love art, but I can never feel it, touch it, taste it. And so I thought to myself, why don't create something where everybody can taste? Edible art is about the five senses for me. It's very important because no one else kind of really allow you to destroy art. Uh, but I love it. I love it when someone destroys it in a way because then you don't keep it. You're always creating something new. You're always pushing the boundary. Janice paints with chocolates, fruits, and other materials otherwise encountered as ingredients in her pastries. It's an art installation you can eat. Janice wants to push boundaries in food, in art, and in food as art, and push those boundaries everywhere. Even here in Tokyo, a challenging market for cooks and artists. Two years ago, Janice opened a dessert restaurant in Tokyo. She looks forward to every visit here, for the vibe as much as for the work. And it's just, you know, inspirational. At every turn that you go, there's always different disciplines that are um, pushing themselves to be more and more perfect. I think that's what it is. Um, the level of perfection here is just incredible. Janice sees the Mori Digital Art Museum as the essence of what she means by pushing boundaries and seeking perfection. Her friend, the museum's artistic director, Kudo Takashi, suggested she check out a new exhibition. And I try to know boundaries between the people and the artworks. And the people are going to be also with one, one part of this beauty. And and also another part is um, the artworks and the artworks is no boundaries. They are, it's connecting each other. The space itself is always changed. Like in the borderless world, is kind of beautiful. The show is already inspiring Janice, who's onto a new mode of her own. They keep pushing the boundaries, you know. It's not just only digital art in the one form, whether it's 2D, you know, they made it 3D. It's also very emotional. And that's what we do with our food art as well. You know, we want people to touch it. We want people to connect with it. We actually want them to also come close to it. Some days, Art has to step aside for commerce. This is one of those days. Janice thinks of Tokyo as her laboratory. Diego, a patissier from Brazil, is in town to collaborate on an event at Janice's restaurant. This is one way she's building her global brand. 
in Tokyo, we, are, we do maybe about four collaborations a year. And it's extremely important because you bounce ideas off each other, you inspire each other. Um, I gain a, no a lot of knowledge about somebody else's culture. Without that, I wouldn't be able to progress as much as I can now. Diego gets up to speed for the events. While Janice celebrates a new coup, it's all in her work in a museum. I've always loved art in a museum. But I can never imagine one day I'll be loaning my art to a museum. I mean, that's just really, really crazy. And especially in Japan. Art is in the eye of the beholder. A curator in Nagoya commissioned these for a temporary exhibition. Some pieces just returned. One achievement fades to memory, another blossoms. This one is in the Ritsi Shinjuku district. A shopaholic's delight. Janice's event is only hours away. Janice serves desserts for lunch. That's fine in Tokyo. The Japanese take food seriously, even sweets. Being in Japan, there are hundreds and hundreds of years of traditions of them giving these confectionery sweets to others. Even the empress, for example, did that, right? Um, in Singapore, it's kind of like, let's see what is the new trend. And now it's like, you know, the Japanese cheesecakes are in, so it's kind of a melting pot of every single type of new confectionery that, that wants to be the in thing. Um, yes, it's a disadvantage, but also it has its advantages because it allows us to also have our own story. We could tell our own story and be successful in it and not having anyone judge us. Janice's story shows a new breed of Singaporean reaching out to the world with passion. Back home, a countryman is pursuing his dream to the same degree. Jonathan passionately believes that Singapore has a future in space. Built on research and market savvy, he's created an association to advance that cause. When I was a child, um, I, I enjoyed a lot of science fiction books. In those days, I think in the, in the 70s and 80s, yes, you know, it, it is probably seen as pure science fiction. But as the decades go by, and today especially when we look at the movies that are coming out, uh, how we are looking at venturing to other uh, planets, uh, studying uh, other solar systems, uh, even the technologies uh, on Earth today that we are seeing, um, the rate of advancement is so high that sometimes besides the lightsaber, as I always say, you know, I think most other things we can probably achieve you know, in the coming decades or so. So again, I think it's just a matter of how, how far and how high you want to go. Jonathan missed out on an actual space program. So he built his own network that's reaching for the stars from Singapore. We see space from a very commercial angle because there are a lot of commercial spin-offs. So you can allow companies to try and test new models. You can help them with grow business development. You can allow ta talent as well to join local and foreign companies here in these budding enterprises. And uh, to some degree today, you also see a lot of innovators and startups coming to Singapore uh, to take an active role uh, within the space industry, uh, trying and testing groundbreaking concepts and um, competing side by side with international uh, players today. Ten years on, the spores he sent out are bearing fruit. It's basically two places, uh, which yeah. is this area and that's a government-owned library. He mentored Rohit and Dinesh, who two years ago founded Transcelestial Technologies. Transcelestial is developing laser comms technologies Local investors have signed on. So have players in Korean telecom. I remember the first time we met Jonathan. It was at a space conference held in NUS. At that moment, we had not had a company yet. 
We still haven't um, officially began anything, but he just began helping us out. To talk to people in the government, to talk to the general industry, whether it's the uh, space industry or the telco industry, and reach out to that whole industry globally from Singapore. Jonathan advised the pair and supported their early efforts. The startup obtained over $2 million in seed money and brought out a working prototype. The device sends and receives gobs of data by laser. Yes, uh, so this unit there transmits a laser to the other side, where a similar unit is transmitting a laser back, carrying data back. So we have a two-way link, and the data speed is the same as a fiber optics link. Developed for space, which has no Wi-Fi or cable links, these lasers could connect Earth to vehicles in space, manned or unmanned. And maybe someday, link up colonies on the furthest of frontiers. Life on Earth is just stuck to one planet. We can be wiped out at any moment by an asteroid or a comet. And it's very unpredictable, so it's natural for us to diversify. And I think, honestly, we should do it because we can. If we can think about being in multiple planets and, and traveling to different galaxies and communicating with them, why shouldn't we do that? We should do that. That's a future that's much more exciting. I think today is a ripe opportunity um, for Singaporeans and for Singapore to participate in the space program, partly because of the rate and the speed at which it's advancing and changing, uh, but also because it's very much more accepting today also of technopreneurs that are willing to make a change. And make a change not just for society, for Singapore society, but for all mankind. I think we have enough people, enough of a common base and like-minded individuals uh, who are willing to share experiences, who are willing to push each other on, uh, build on what we have learned, and literally go where no man has gone before. The sky is, it really isn't a limit in this example. As some Singaporeans reach for the stars, others are getting up off the mat. Professional wrestler Andrew just touched down in Bangkok with protege Trexus. The athletes are here for a tag team throwdown. Uh, it's our international debut. It's going to be special. We're going to show uh, the Thai people why uh, we are the best in Singapore, the best in Southeast Asia. are local favourites. Nothing new for the Singaporeans, who are accustomed to being underdogs and unknowns. Andrew and Trexus hope to win Thai fans tonight. International recognition is key to wrestling circuit success. Whichever countries you wrestle, you know, the crowd is different. So what, uh, what may work in one country, what may work in Singapore may, may work differently in uh, Thailand. So we actually have to like, uh, go and see and uh, wrestle a few times to actually know uh, what kind of style that can actually cater to them so that you can build up your fan base and of course uh, for them to actually give you a reason to support you. Andrew started with a one-way ticket to Palookaville. But he's riding his ambition to higher and higher rungs. All he had was 20 grand in savings and a burning desire to succeed. He focused on making his dream real, making a name for himself, and ignoring the haters, baiters, and told you so downgraders. They would say like, hey, Andrew, please don't be stupid. Like, no wrestling won't, like, won't ever make it big in Singapore. You know, uh, how can you compare yourself to the, the big wrestlers? You know, I mean, you're so short. You know, the wrestlers in the WWE, they're at least six foot or six foot two. You know, yeah, I mean, it's really hurtful. And oh, most morally, I, can, can this uh, pro wrestling thing sustain you financially? You know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, I don't blame them because, you know, it's not going to be, it's going to be a very tedious process. It's not an easy way to actually climb out to where we are right now. I think I represent hope 
to a normal wrestling fan. I think I was just an avid fan like them. You know, a boy that just wants to actually live his dreams. Stand-up comedy has blown up since Fakka Faz blew into town. I start coming here, everybody goes, will there people be like, I can't, you know? I mean, he goes, no, because we serve pork. Oh! <laughs> and I feel like, like the crowd has grown and the crowd has matured and the crowd has begun to understand the kind of style of, of, of comedy that we're doing and hopefully one day the crowd will grow with us. Oh! And that sure, it's nice to fill a hometown hall. But Fuzz wants his career and his routines to reach further. He has eyes to start afresh and corral a new following. He's after the biggest of the big smokes, the USA. America is a land of self-invention. Everybody there is from somewhere else. Guys, this is where it all happens. Los Angeles, Hollywood! Fuzz has no choice but to go big or go home. There's no point playing it safe because safe will always be forgotten. Why, why you, you, the worst thing to be in life is forgotten. And if you play within the lines of where you're familiar with, then where's room to learn? There's no room to fall. There's no room uh, for people to criticize you. There's no room for you to like uh, discover a new way to perform. There's no room for you to grow if all you do is playing it safe. Yeah. So I thought LA, right, the city of dreams, right? Uh, I've always wanted to go to LA. I knew there was like 2,000 to 3,000 people with the same dream as me. So I'm not even faced by that, right? I just want to be in the race. If I'm in the race, running with you on an international level, coming from where I'm from, coming from Geelang Sarai, right? Coming from Geelang Sarai, right? Going all the way straight to LA, running the same race as you guys, dude, that makes me happy. That's my mind. I'm pretty sure that makes my community happy. Now that you're really out of your comfort zone, what do you got? Right, it's time for you to showcase your actual skill. It's time for you to see if your humor translates or your stories translate from being a Singaporean to being a voice from Singapore. Fuzz lives to make wisdom sound like funny stories and vice versa. Nice to be here. Uh, my name is Fuzz. I am from Singapore. Priya is also stepping out of her comfort zone as an artist. Known more for her guerrilla approach through her public installations, Priya has been invited to stage her first solo exhibition at a gallery. So this installation is basically a development from my public installation work, um, which I hang like 24 flags on a HDB block. So this one is kind of like a development from that. Um, and I realized that the responses were pretty much labels to my work and I wanted to kind of like use that labels and kind of like represent the responses on my work. The show is to be called Upgraded, bringing to mind Priya's references on Singapore's public housing and her own coming of age as an artist. I think Singapore has some of the conditions to let artists thrive. What I feel it needs more is more opportunities for artists to kind of like exhibit their work, give them the potential to, you know, just show what they are capable of. So I know you don't have a universal experience of teachers. Some of you have great teachers, some of you have not so great teachers, right? But let's talk about the grooming people's mm -hmm. potential. That's something Quick Xiao Yin had set out to do here. Quick helped found this tuition center or test prep facility called 
the school of thought. Singapore has plenty of cram schools. At school of thought, however, the point isn't top grades, but clarifying one's vision of oneself. The path is simple and challenging. Compose a general paper. The GCE A-level general paper uh, is a wonderful subject. It's a paper that challenges you to, um, to compose and to comprehend how uh, people think about the world and how people think about current affairs. It's a fantastic paper, great for deep thinking. Quick wants to take her mission into Singapore at large, helping fellow citizens find opportunities to make a difference by following their passions. That's why she organizes these civic trails. I don't think fashion is just uh, a thing that artists and poets and creatives care about. Passions root word is the Latin phrase, uh, passio. So that means to suffer. So when I think of passion, I tend to think of it as what do you love so much that you are willing to suffer for? You're willing to go through quite a lot of uh, trouble in your life to achieve. But if you want your passion to have greater impact, then you have to mature your passion into a compassion. If I had to give any advice to a young person today, it's develop your passion. Don't just follow your passion, um, develop it. And when you develop it, uh, learn to then mature your passion into a compassion for other people, other problems. Uh, because if you do, then you'll be surprised at what new opportunities come out for it. So it's passion, then compassion, and then opportunity. Yeah. Passion, compassion, opportunity. The very topics on Sebastian Sim's mind these days. Sebastian is a novelist. I remember when I read the book, a Suitable Boy by Vikram Sif. I was so mesmerized because there's this, this, this uh, I think it's a thousand page novel, and there's so much Indian culture and magic in it. And um, that's how someone would read the book, would fall in love with a country like India and the culture and the people down there. And so I feel that as a storyteller from Singapore, uh, I make it my calling to do the same for Singapore. As a writer, Sebastian wound up playing the long game. A very, very long game. His first English language novel, Gimme Lao, chronicles life for a Singaporean born the night the nation became independent. Protagonist Gimme Lao is ambitious and impatient. A Singaporean Singaporean, one might say. Gimme Lao debuted two years ago. Sebastian was 50. Just before I left National Service, my platoon commander actually sat a few of us um, in a circle and, and wanted us to share what were our aspirations. So there were those who said, I want to set up my own business within 10 years. They'll say, I, there were some who said, I want to be in teaching profession. I told them I want to be a storyteller. I want to be a published novelist. And I gave myself 20 years. So when I said 20 years, the rest of them were staring at me like, what? And of course, uh, my friends were a bit shocked. So I'm glad to say that uh, after 20, 30 years, if they read today's papers, they'll see that uh, they were featuring a review of my newest book. So I hope they're happy for me. Now Sebastian is working on a novel about a riot in Singapore. Uh, when an event like Little India Riot occurs, it is first of all a news item. But news item will capture the attention uh, for the day, for the week, for the month. But one year later, there'll be other news items to catch uh, the people's attention. But if you present an issue like this in a form of literature, uh, it has a longer shelf life. And uh, anybody, even the future generations who pick it up, 
uh, they, they will be introduced to this issue and they will be able to think more about it. So there's this ongoing conversation about uh, what may be wrong about our society at that point in time or even then. So I think that's one of the functions of a good book. It keeps the issues alive. I think Singapore is in an inflection point in our history. But after year 50, the great question that's posed in front of us is, so now who do we want to be? Now that we have finished up chapter one, which is we managed to beat the odds and succeed and become a highly developed nation. Well, who do we want to be now? Can Singapore be a more compassionate society? Can Singapore be a more collaborative or empathetic society? Can it give a space for more creativity to explore the arts, um, to explore the softer side of things? Um, these are questions that we get a chance to ask because of all the success we have achieved in the first 50 years. So it is a very good time, a very profound time for all of us to really look at what is the Singapore we want to see at year 100 because the groundwork starts now. You can have all the right moves and the right combinations, but if you can't take the punches, it doesn't mean a thing. In their everyday lives and in their spotlight moments, these Singaporeans are punching above their weight, giving as good as they get and more to leave a mark. Whether they're enabled by opportunities or creating them for others, they are advancing their situation and their cities to say, I was here and I mattered. And they've only just begun. Our passionate Singaporeans venture even further to far bigger stages when City of Opportunities continues.